Um, I have it. Lord. <laughs> Well, you know, a couple weeks ago we finished with the book of First Peter. Um, but I'm going to start with a verse from First Peter as we jump into something else today. The book, the verse in First Peter is First Peter chapter four, verse eight. It says, "Above all things, have fervent charity or love among yourselves." For charity or love shall cover a multitude of sin. And so, as we go from there, go from 1 Peter, we're going to be looking at this idea of love amongst the brethren. We talked about how love covers a multitude of sins. The love of God sent Jesus Christ to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. But love for one another also covers a multitude of sins and wrongdoing because as we have the same kind of love that Jesus had for us, then we are apt to forgive one another. Jesus said, as I have loved you, so love ye one another. And so we look at how Jesus loves us and how His love takes care of the, our sin. We are to love one another in the exact same way and so that we don't hold things against one another, but we, we look for the good or look for good for the other person. And that's what love is all about. And it may seem odd to you that I'm going to go where I'm going to go, um, in this because um, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you go, but that's not a chapter about love. And yet it is. It is a chapter about love. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would that you not have be ignorant. Now, I want you to note, and if you can see behind me, the word gifts is in italics, which simply means that it was not in the original text, that this was put in there for us so that we could have a better understanding as to where it was leading us. So we read it as it is now concerning spiritual things. Spiritual, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, and, and Paul speaking to the church in Corinth, which was predominantly a Gentile church. You were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols as you were led. It was a church of pagans. They had been idol worshipers. Uh, they were Greek. They were Romans. They, were, they, they had not been Jewish people brought up to worship the, the God of creation. They were, they were worshiping uh, gods like Apollos and Aphrodite and Diana, these, gods, these, these false gods. And, and so they were worshiping these idols and they had this kind of custom in their, in their making. You know, we, you and I, we were brought up with certain ideas and ideals because of our families, because of our, our, our geography, because of the customs of the, wherever we are. We were brought up with those kind of ideals. If, if we were brought up in Australia, for instance, we would think differently about things than we do here in America. If we were brought up in South America or Central America, we would think differently about some things than we do here in this country. The people in Corinth had a different kind of mindset than the people of Israel. But the gospel of Christ had, been, had come to them, and they, were, they had been converted into Christianity, 
And they were learning how to be good followers of Christ. So as Paul writes to them, he said, you were carried away in, into this worship of dumb idols. Dumb idols meaning that they, they couldn't speak. You know, you have a statue of, a, a, of some whatever over there, God, some type, made of stone or bronze or gold or silver or wood, whatever. And it just stands there and it doesn't speak. It can't because there's no life in it. We have this in the world today. We have peoples in the world today who, who worship these statues who are simply dumb idols. Therefore, he says, I give to you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God can call Jesus accursed, and no man can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. Now, what's he saying? He's saying the Holy Spirit in us. Remember, if we go back to John chapter 20 and verse 22, Jesus was looking or talking to his disciples, and he, it says, and when he had said some of these things that he was teaching them, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Ghost. We see the disciples receiving the Holy Spirit back in the 20th chapter of John. Now, you go, but I thought that happened on the day of Pentecost. No, it didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. What happened on the day of Pentecost was an immersion of the Holy Spirit within them. And so there are people, I, I just want you to know that there is, there is these two separate, two separate uh, events that take place in the life of a Christian. Number one, as Peter spoke to the people in Jerusalem on the streets after the Pentecostal experience, he said to them, they said, what must we do? He said to them, repent. In other words, change the way you think, the way you act. You can't keep doing the things that you were doing. Be baptized into the name of Jesus or into the body of Jesus. Again, we use that word name very loosely because it really means into his character. Be baptized into the character of Christ and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Now that's one thing. But what happened in the upper room when, when the believers, the disciples, the 120 were there, something supernatural that was different from this thing that Jesus was telling them in John 20, something different happened to them, and as they were praying and seeking God, the Holy Spirit descended upon them. See, before this, Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. He's received the Holy Ghost. And He breathed on them. His Spirit, His life breathed into them. And they went out, and they, they spoke about the kingdom of God. They healed the sick. They, they, they cast out demons. did all of these things prior to the day of Pentecost. But now the day of Pentecost had come, and the Holy Spirit was poured down upon them, it says there was like the sound as of a rushing mighty wind. It doesn't say there was a rushing mighty wind. Please. People go, well, if there was this rushing mighty wind, how come the people down in the streets didn't hear? It wasn't a rushing mighty wind. It was the sound in that room as of a rushing mighty wind. And tongues as like fire came down upon them and they received or they came upon them as the the embellishment, the, the, the clothing, the, the saturation of the Holy Spirit. And it says, And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, we're going to start from that point today. We're going to start from that point. Because this was, in fact, a different thing than what happened when Jesus breathed upon them and said, Receive the Holy Ghost. We're going to start at this point. So Paul says, now, if you have that Holy Spirit in you, 
If, if the Holy Spirit of God is in you, you cannot deny the Lordship, the deity of Christ. That's what it means to be accursed. Because Jesus said He was the Son of God, that He was. I am, He said. And if, if He was a liar, then He's cursed. So if the Holy Spirit is in you, you, must, you recognize who He is, that He is who He said He was, that He was God incarnate, as the, as, as the prophets said, e Emmanuel, God with us, that He was the Son of God sent to take away the sins of the world, that His death on the cross was, was to shed the blood of sacrifice for all of our sins, that He rose from the dead and He rules and reigns in, from heaven right now. If the Holy Spirit is in you, you can't say that, this, that isn't true. And if the Holy Spirit is in you, is not in you, you cannot say that He is your Lord. The average guy on the street can't just go, well, you know, you know, Jesus is Lord. How? And they can say the words, but they can't say, you know, Jesus is my Lord. They, they can't say it and mean it. See, that's what it means. It doesn't mean you can't utter those words. I, I've had... Some people go, well, you know, if, if somebody has uh, some kind of demonic force in them, they can't say the words, Jesus is Lord. No, that's not true. There were demons out there during Jesus' time saying, we know who you are. You are the, the, the anointed one of God. You are the Messiah. See, the demons can say those things. It's not saying the words. It is meaning what those words mean in your life. So the Holy Spirit is what brings to you the understanding and gives to you the knowledge. He is, the Holy Spirit is the seal that you have of your salvation. And when you have that seal on you for salvation, Jesus is your Lord. Now, there are different kinds of gifts we have one Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. It's the same, same, one and the same. The Holy Spirit is that same Spirit that went upon the face of the deep back in Genesis 1. The Holy Spirit is that same one that lighted upon Christ at His baptism in the form of a, de a, a dove. The same Spirit, it's the same Spirit that Jesus breathed into His disciples. It's the same Spirit that came upon Samson to give him great strength. The same Spirit that came upon the prophets of old that gave them the ability to tell the Word of God. He is the Spirit of God. And, and He is in you if you are a born-again Christian. He is there with you. Jesus said He will be with you and He will be in you and He will lead you into all truth and He will guide you. He will teach you the things that you need to know. He is God with you. The Holy Spirit is, in fact, too, as well as Christ, Emmanuel. God with us. Because He is the Spirit of Christ. So there's one Spirit, but there are different kinds of gifts and there are different kinds of administrations. In other words, different ways that those gifts are used. And there are different kinds of operations, different places, different, different ministries. But it is the same God, same Spirit, which works all in all. The next verse, verse 7, is, is very, very, very important. Because no matter which side of the baptism in the Holy Spirit doctrine you happen to be on, there are those who say it's 
that was a long time ago and it's not for today. There are others who say, if, if you don't exhibit some of these things, then you can't be saved. In the middle there is some truth. The manifestation, the manifestation, the evidence of the Spirit is given to every man to profit all. See up there? 1 Corinthians 12, 7. So, when we, we have this basis, you say, well, what does this have? To, I thought you were going to talk about love. I am. Because every, the, the person of the Holy Spirit in us is where the source of love is in us. I want to say that again. The person of the Holy Spirit in us is where the source of love is in us. You do not have the capacity to love people that oppose you, that, that, you're, that are distasteful to you, people that you don't like, people that you don't even know. You don't have the capacity to love them outside of the love that the Holy Spirit gives to us. He goes on and he starts talking about these different manifestations. To one is given the spirit of a word of wisdom. And I, I'm going to look up here on our screen, those of you who can see these things. I don't know if you can read them all the way back there. But wisdom is the ability to see a circumstance and apply God's word to it to fulfill God's plan. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is that ability to see a circumstance and then apply the word of God to it to fulfill the plan of God in that circumstance. That's wisdom. Wisdom begins with what? The fear of the Lord, according to Scripture. Well, what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is recognizing the, who God is. He's the creator of all things. He is the author, the finisher of all things. He is the one who is, it deserves all, power, all, all reverence, all worship, all praise. That He has the ability to end it all. He has the, the right to direct it all according to His plan. Wisdom begins with that fear of the Lord. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. And knowledge is to know about things that were not learned or understood in a natural way. So I can have, I can have the knowledge of... Uh, well, knowledge that says, if you go over there and flip that switch on the wall, it's going to turn the lights on. That's, not, that's natural knowledge. But there are things which God reveals to us that we cannot learn naturally. Knowledge, and we've seen this uh, exhibited sometimes when, when someone comes up to you or, or you feel towards someone else, something that is going on in that person's life that they've not revealed to you. And God gives you this knowledge about that. To another, faith. Well, I thought, and the Bible says it's given to every man the measure of faith. It's given to every man a measure of faith. Everybody has a certain measure of faith. If you're sitting on your chair right now, you had faith that that chair wasn't going to collapse when you sat down. If you're listening to me right now, chances are you have faith that God is going to say something, something to you through me. I have faith when it's standing here, that God is going to say something during this time through me to affect you positively. We have that kind of faith. We have faith. People say, well, I believe in God. That's faith. See, I believe in God. I, 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 but faith is not belief. I, I want to put it this way. My wife has a box in her kitchen. 
And in that box are a number, you know, piles of little cards and pieces of paper and things cut out of magazines, and they're called recipes. Recipes. So, somebody calls her and says, how can I make something or other? Do you have the recipe for this? And she pulls it out. She looks at it and she goes, yeah, I have it right here. It says that if I add this ingredient and this ingredient and cook it this long and add this ingredient and do this to it, and then you know it's going to turn out to be something. That's my recipe. Okay. Obviously, she believes that that recipe is going to produce the, the, the thing that she's wanting to cook or bake or fry or whatever it is she's going to do with it. She has that belief. Now she has the opportunity at that point to take that piece of paper, stuck it, stick it back in the box, close it up, and walk away. But if someone says, "Do you believe that that recipe you have is it would make a good, let's say, make a good chocolate cake?" She says, "Yeah, I believe that. It make a great chocolate cake. I've, I've made it before. I know that it make a great chocolate cake. My my mother made used that recipe. My my aunt used that recipe. I always liked their cakes. I believe it." That's belief. Or she can take that recipe out and she can say, okay, let's do this. Let's put all this together. Let's put the chocolate and, this, and whatever else is involved in making a chocolate cake. I'm not, a, I'm not a baker. Put all that stuff together, mix it up, and do what the recipe says. That's faith. Because she's putting her efforts into what she believes. Now, the good deed, see, we go, well, you're talking about good works. No. See, the good work is the cake that's sitting on the table that I'm going to eat. She had belief in the recipe. She had faith that when she did what the recipe said, it was going to turn out to be a great chocolate cake. And the res end result was the cake sitting on the table. And I'd say, this is really a good thing. You really did a good thing making this cake. That's the deed. So faith is not what I believe, but what I do about what I believe. Does that make sense? So he's given to us some faith. He's given to us the ability to do something about what we believe. The Holy Spirit comes upon the world. The Bible says the Holy Spirit came into the world to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Well, what's that mean? The Holy Spirit comes into the people who are of the world, not Christians per se, but to teach them that this is a sin. You can't, God, God is not happy with this. This is contrary to God's plan for your life. This is sinful. You need to do something about it. Convicts us of sin, of righteousness, of what it takes to get right with God. Well, what's it going to take to get for a sinner to get right with God? They have to come to the Lord, repent, like Peter said, receive Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, be baptized, and the Holy Spirit will come to live within them. And then the judgment which is coming, which would be either if I rejected the message or I accepted the message and I lived my life either way, the judgment is going to be based upon that. The Bible says that we shall be, every man shall be judged according to his deeds. So, the Holy Spirit comes into the world to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Then the Holy Spirit is in the believer, as we said earlier, to lead us into truth, to remind us of the things which we've been taught, and to, and to give us new understanding. It says to another, the gifts of healing, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, the ability to believe God to heal. The ability to step forth and be useful to God, or useful to a person, in the, in the God's healing of others. Whether it's lay, laying on of hands and praying for them according to Scripture and anointing them with oil. You know, James says, is there any sick among you? 
Let them call upon the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with oil. Lay them on of hands. The prayer of the righteous. The prayer of the righteous will heal the sick. If they've, if they've committed a sin, it'll be forgiven them. In other cases, just speaking the words. Peter and John in the, in the temple with the man who was lame saying, I don't have any silver or gold to give you, but such as I have in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Grabbing him by the hand, lifting him up. And the man was healed and began running and leaping and praising God within the temple. And, and Peter said to the folk around them, he says, don't look on us like we've done this. This isn't us. See, one of the problems we have with the manifestations of the Holy Spirit is we kind of think that, you know, it's us. I'm special. See what the Holy Spirit's using me for? See, I'm, I'm, I'm... No, it's not. Peter and John said, that's not us. It was faith in the name. It was the name of Jesus and faith in that name that raised this man up, that gave him, made him whole. So we, we have that, that. That opportunity is given to us. To another, the working of miracles. And miracles are something that you can't do on your own. Mankind can't do it on your own. It's a miracle of God. Alright? I, you know, sometimes we think of, I, you know, I went down the street and I needed a parking place, so I said, God, give me a parking place. And as I was going down the street, I saw this guy pull out. Oh, that was a miracle. No, it was a guy pulling out of his parking spot and you happened to be driving by at the same time. If, if you happened to drive, seeing that man pulling out and, and then somebody else pulled in, would you consider that a curse? I don't know. See, miracles are things that are not natural. Miracles are not storms unless they appear out of nothing. They're not earthquakes. They're not natural. Miracles are things that God does supernaturally. The things that God does supernaturally, and there have been some storms that God provided supernaturally to help God's people. We have miracles in the Bible. We have miracles every day. They're happening. Yes, they are. I have had miracles take place in my life. Not that I've performed them, but they have happened to me. Things that were absolutely impossible, but they happened. See, miracles do take place. And so he gives to some the ability to perform miracles. To another, prophecy. Prophecy. When we look at prophecy, prophecy is speaking out what God has, is revealing at a given time. It can be anything. It's not necessarily fortune telling. It's not always saying, well, you know, next week this is going to happen. That's not, it's, it's just saying, this is what God is saying to you now. It may incorporate an event that's going to take place or it may just incorporate a word to you like a word of knowledge or word of wisdom at that point God's saying this is what I want you to see and understand right now prophecies then one that I consider to be very very important is the discerning of spirits which is simply Nothing, none of these are simple. Uh, which means that you can see something or hear something and the Holy Spirit would reveal to you whether this is, an, is in fact of God or is it of something else. Is this from God or is this some man trying to point, prove his point? Is it some demonic force trying to enforce you know, his, his ideas on people? Is, it, is, it, you know, what, is this really of God? The discerning of spirits. It's not the gift of discernment, which a lot of people misquote. It's a discerning of spirits to discern, to be able to tell the difference between what spirit is behind whatever it is that is happening at that time. And to another, again, the word divers there is in italics. To another, kinds of tongues, which are languages 
speaking God's uh, speaking of God's greatness in a foreign language, prayer languages are different. They're, they differ. Speaking in tongues without an interpreter, as we're going to see later on, is the misuse of that. I want to stop here for just a moment and, and, and kind of focus on this. And, and you say, well, why are you going to stop on tongues? Because tongues are the most uh, prominent, I would say, prominently used and misused gift or manifestation of the Holy Spirit. We hear people talking about the, the, the glossonalia, speaking in tongues. Um, there, is, there is a purpose for tongues and there, and there is a misuse of tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 3 and 4 say this, he that prophesies speaks to men to the edification and the exhortation and comfort. He speaks to men out there. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. But he that prophesies edifies the church. Now I want to go back to the very beginning of when we started talking about the, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Because when we were told that the, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit are given to each individual to profit all. So Paul speaks out here in this, to the same church and he's saying the gift of tongues is really there to edify the person who is speaking in tongues. What's he mean by that? I, he, he goes on and he says, I wish all of you spoke in tongues. He says, I speak in tongues more than all of you and I wish all of you did but I would rather that you prophesy. Because prophecy speaks for the edification of the church, but who speaks in the tongue edifies himself. There is a bit of us and our old nature that is constantly involved in who we are and what we do. And, you know, we want to feel good. We want to have what we can get. You know, we spoke earlier about how the church, as we pray, the church has been has been looking at, well, what is God doing for me? What will God do for me? And so, I don't want to belittle any of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit because none of them are small. None of, none of them are little. I, but I, I do want to belittle people who misuse God's Word and God's presence in their lives because they deserve to be brought down. The gift of tongues is given to us as a evidence. We, uh, we are told that, that the evidence, uh, that the gift of tongues evidence is for the believers, or for the unbelievers. As we see the gifts of tongues being used in the church of, or in the streets of Jerusalem, we see that that gift brought out the word of God to people of various languages in their own language. One of the things that we need to understand is that the gift, the gift, is not as important as the purpose of the gift. We're going to see that later on as we read. The gift is not as important as the purpose of the gift. God gave us a gift for a reason. As we, as we look in, in the book of Acts about when the Holy Spirit was poured out, Acts chapter 2, verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They went down into the streets and they began to speak and the people said, we hear them speaking about the marvelous acts of God. That's what they were speaking. The purpose was not so that they all began speaking in other languages, but the purpose was so that they could spread the word of God in the various languages to the people. In Acts chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Cretes and Arabians, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. See, that was the purpose of the gift. If they had just stayed in the upper room and just 
sat there and, and spoke in tongues, the entire purpose would have been lost. In Acts chapter 10, in verse 46, it says, They heard them, this is the Gentiles, they heard the Gentiles speak with tongues and do what? And magnify God. And so Peter said, well, see what God is doing with them? This was a sign to, that, to the believers that these people were in fact being included by God. In Acts chapter 19, we talk about, oh, the Holy Spirit was poured out and they began to speak in other tongues in all these different places. Acts chapter 19, verse 6 says, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues, and they prophesied. In other words, they spoke the word of God out. So in every case, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon a group of people, whether it was the, the disciples in the upper room, the Gentiles, the house of Cornelius, the place where you know they, they, Peter went and he was speaking to those who had been taught by Apollos, wherever it was and the Holy Spirit came down upon them and they began to speak in other tongues, the end result of that was they spoke about the glorious things of God. It wasn't the fact that you just sat there and they spoke in tongues. The purpose behind it is all important. Now, that being said, that being said, I want to go, I want to step back a moment and talk about the fact that God has given to us what we call a prayer language. And the prayer language is that which when, when we are by ourselves with the Lord and we are praying about, about a certain topic and we're not sure exactly how to pray. You know, have you ever been there? I have been. I mean, and let's just look at the, at the current circumstances of our country right now. And you say, you know, here we have, you know, we have the, the left wing, we have the right wing, we have those who stand in no wings at all, you know. Um, we have, we have uh, people in the streets demanding their civil rights. We have people on the other side saying, you don't have any rights. We have people coming from foreign countries coming in to say, because they said, you know, life in America is so much better than where we're coming from, and we feel like we should be able to come in and, and become part of that, and people on the inside saying, look, this is my land and you can't come. You know, we have all these different things going on. And so when you get down on your knees before the Lord, and you know, and I, I don't insist, but I, I think that I advise us to get on our knees before God once in a while. When we get, get before the Lord in prayer, and, and we are not knowing exactly how to pray here. Because I'll be honest with you, I can see positive and negative things on everybody's viewpoint. And I'm not God. And neither are you. And so, what we need to do is we need to go to God and say, Lord, this is a problem. We have this problem. There's so much unrest and so much violence and so much craziness going on. God, I need for you to help me to know how to pray. Now, we're told that there's times when we don't know how to pray and the Holy Spirit prays, you know, prays for us. That's not what this is talking about. This is, I don't know how to pray, and so I'm going to go to the Lord, I'm going to ask about, God, how, what do I pray about? And the Lord who knows your heart, if your heart is right, if you have the heart of Christ, if you, you know, you know Jesus wanted all the Pharisees to get saved? He wasn't against the Pharisees. He wanted to see them saved. He wanted to see them changed so that they, would, they could preach the gospel to the people of Israel. So they would recognize that he was the Messiah. It wasn't his plan to destroy the Phariseeisms, whatever they were. His plan was to bring truth to all people. Sometimes when we pray, we're not interested in whether they get saved. 
We're only interested in getting our way. We want things to go the way we think is right. But sometimes I have found in my own life, I, I, yeah, the way that I think is right maybe isn't the way God thinks is right. And so, if I'm just praying for my own self-will, well, God, this is the way I see it, and I think you ought to do it this way. If God spoke audibly to me, He'd say, you know what, I really don't care how you see it. And I didn't ask for your advice. He said that to Job, didn't he? He says, he says I have a plan here, and I'm going to work it out. And what I need is for you to stand by my side, not ask me to stand by your side. We have a tendency to put ourselves first and then ask God to accompany us. God says, no, you need to love me with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I need to be number one, and you accompany me. In those kind of cases, because I don't know how to pray, I get down on my knees and I, and I just say, Lord, help me pray. And often, as I'm praying with other tongues, in other words, the Bible says we, with the tongues of men and angels, we, it, we don't, may not know. Pray with other tongues. And I'm, and I'm praying, saying, Lord, I just want your will to be done, not mine. I don't know. God, I just, I just, just want to be with you. I want, I want to be with you on your side. And the prayer kind of goes in that direction. And I have found the next thing. It says, and another, the interpretation of tongues. I have found that in that process, very often, God will not only let me pray in my in unknown tongues, but He will then give me an understanding more of what I am praying about and for. Now, I, I focused on tongues for that reason, because we have made tongues the banner over which we call the Holy Spirit. And it was never meant to be that. It was, it was meant to be a tool that God gives to us to help us to proclaim the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14.5, Paul says, I would that you all spoke with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. So if I'm going to put if I'm going to put emphasis here, Paul says, I'm putting emphasis on you saying what God is saying, not on you just speaking in tongues. Because he that speaks with the tongues, except he interprets, does not edify the church. But when you interpret it, then you can tell, say what God is saying. Verse 22 of chapter 14. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that do not believe. Why is that? Because if I'm speaking in tongues in, a, in an open area, then I, God, is, God doesn't just let you want you to stand up in the middle of a crowd and just begin speaking in something, some language, unknown language, and nobody understands it. In fact, Paul tells us, warns us against that. He says, don't do that. People are just going to think you're nuts. And if you're praying openly in tongues, they don't know what you're praying about, so how are they going to be able to agree with you? So, so the sign is to those who don't believe. Why? Because if I'm going to speak in tongues uh, by the guiding of the Holy Spirit, it will be like it was on the day of Pentecost when I'm speaking to someone who speaks another language and I'm speaking to them of the great things of God. See, we are warned about the misuse. We are told what the right use is. He says, but prophecy, on the other hand, 
is not for those who believe because we are, you know, we already know the Word of God, but for those, or not for those who don't believe because they don't know it, but for those of us who do believe so that we can know what God is up to. So we should pray that we profit, that we can interpret if we are going to have an ex exhibit of the gifts of tongues. So now let's let's go back. I'm going to wrap this up here in just a second. All of these things that we talked about, all of them, are given to us for the building up of the church. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings and prophecy and discerning of spirits, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues are all given to us to build up the church. To build up the church. It's not for us, for us to separate us, our little group, from that group over there in the body of Christ. Oh, we got this and you don't have it. Ha ha, we're better. It's not for that. It is to edify the entire church, the body of Christ. Because we, there is one spirit and one body. And we have all been baptized by that spirit into one body. So whatever the Holy Spirit does, it is to edify the entirety of the body. That means we who, we who are Pentecostal, and we are, when God uses or uses us in any way, it should be something that edifies our brothers and sisters who are Baptist and Episcopalian and Presbyterian and Lutheran and whatever. Not just our crowd. And we need to understand that, that we are all one body in Christ. And, and, be, and when we understand that we are all one body in Christ, then this idea of loving one another as Christ has loved us starts to tie us together. And next week we're going to pick up on this right here and we're going to move on because this the whole purpose of this message was not to dwell on these manifestations of the Holy Spirit, but to bring us to an understanding of the, the things that God does in us and with us and through us that we might show love to the body. That's what it's all about. So, we're going to pick up here. We're going to be going through the rest of chapter 12 and into chapter 13. And you people, oh, chapter 13, that's the love chapter. Yes, it is. And, and we're going to be talking about these kind of things. That Paul says... At the end of this chapter, he says, look, if you, you can do all of this. He said, hey, you can be out there, you know, super spiritual, super, super powerful, super whatever Christian. But if you don't love the people around you, you have become a black hole in the, hot, in, in, in the church of Christ. You're just sucking in and, taking the, and, and giving nothing out. You're just making a, a loud noise. You're just making a name for yourself. He says, this nuts not what it's about. So the close the close this morning is this. Should we speak in tongues? Absolutely. Should we be laying hands on the sick and seeing them healed? Absolutely. Should we be prophesying? Sure. Should we be allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us things that we don't know? <laughs> of course. That's he says he's going to lead us into all truth, teach us those things we don't know, right? Should we have the word of wisdom? In other words, should we be seeking God to show us how to use God's word for a partic particular circle? Yes, and that's the whole plan here. The whole plan is to do that. Should we have faith? Of course we should have faith. How are we ever going to accomplish anything unless we step out on what we believe? Should we... Use the gift of tongues. Yes, we should. In its proper context, and in proper context within a crowd, it's with an interpreter, so that those who are with us would be edified. 
You say, well, I don't have any of those things working in my life, Pastor. I, I, you know, how, do, how does that happen? Well, see, here's what you got to do. Um, you write out a check for $1,000 to the church. You come to, no, that's not it at all. What you should do is you set your heart on worshiping God. You set your heart upon letting Christ be the king of your life. You determine that you want to glorify him and edify or, and, 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 and yeah, edify him and, and exalt him. Not edify him, exalt him and edify the church in everything that you do. You make up your mind that you don't really care if nobody remembers your name, nobody remembers that you even passed by, but when you leave, that they, have, will have, that they will have been changed and they will know Jesus Christ. You make him the object of your affection and the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon you as the Spirit desires. Don't let anybody tell you you have to perform in any particular way. The only one who has the right to tell you that is God. And God will use you in the way that He sees fit for the moment that you happen to be in. And it might be something today and something totally different tomorrow. But if you will spend your time worshiping God, asking Him to give you all He has for you, because you want to give it all away to the body of Christ. Nothing for yourself. All for Jesus. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. See, the Holy Spirit is not manipulated. He's not bought. He is, he is not conjured. The Holy Spirit is, is freely placed in the heart of every individual who receives Christ as Lord and Savior. And, the Holy, and, and as we yield to Him, as we yield to Him, as we yield to Him, the Holy Spirit starts working more and more and more and more. And people will know that we are His disciples by the fact that we speak in tongues? No. By the fact that we heal the sick? No. They'll know that we are His disciples by our love for one another. <clears throat> Father, we're not very good at this, Lord. I'm not very good at it. I thank you, Lord, that you don't get so upset with us that you just wipe us out. I thank you, Lord, that you know our names. I thank you, Lord, that you know who I am and you know my heart. I thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit puts checks on my life. And when I start to think differently than I ought to, He comes in and He says, Hey, hey, take note here. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord, that you allow me to even stand here and proclaim your word.
because God, I know there are millions of other people who could do it better than me. That you ask me to stand here. And God, I am I'm ashamed that I don't do it better. Help me, Father. Help me, please help me. And help us to be the messengers that you've called us to be of the good news to this world. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.